Hello and welcome to lecture 16 for the course ECE 252B, uh, spring quarter 2020. Uh, this lecture deals with chapter 18 in the textbook, floating point operations. In the previous lecture, we talked about uh, floating point formats, how floating point numbers are represented and what are the key properties of the floating point representation. Uh, in this lecture, we are going to learn methods of doing arithmetic on floating point numbers, in particular designing adders, multipliers, and dividers for floating point operands. A square rooting, which is also a basic arithmetic operation, we'll deal with later. Basically, there's one chapter dealing with square rooting for both fixed point and floating point numbers. So we postpone that to chapter 21. Okay, so let's get started by looking at floating point addition. In floating point addition, when you have two numbers with significant S1 and exponent E1, and the other one significant S2 and exponent E2, um, as I mentioned last time, you basically equalize the exponent to the larger of the two exponents. So I'm assuming here that E1 is greater than or equal to E2. So E1 is the larger exponent. So I basically shift the significant S2 to the right by E1 minus E2 radix B digits. So if I'm doing IEEE floating point arithmetic, B will be 2. More generally, the E1 minus E2 radix B digit, right shift, and then its exponent becomes E1. Then I add the original exponent for number 1 to the right shifted, or sometimes we call aligned, exponent uh, significant of the number 2. And the sum of these two will be the significant of the result. And E1, the larger of the two exponents, will be uh, the exponent of the result. However, I may need to perform an adjustment here if this significant, computed significant here, isn't within the allowed range, which is in the range 1 to 2 for IEEE floating point format. So if it's less than 1, or if it's greater than 2, I need to make adjustments. So here's an example. I have two numbers, x and y, that I want to add. One of them has the exponent 5, and this significant. The other one is exponent 1, and this significant. The smaller exponent the number with the smaller exponent, which is smaller by 4, is right shifted by 4 bits. Okay, so this value is right shifted by 4 bits. So I get 4 extra bits here to the right of this other number. Then I add these two numbers. I get this. And at this point, I notice that the significant is one point something. So it is within the allowed range for significance. It only has four, four extra bits that I need to get rid of. And because I notice that these four extra bits start with a one, and then also continue with one, so it's greater than one half ULP. Therefore, I round up the sum. And this is my final result after rounding. If the two numbers that I'm adding have like signs, then 
each of these, this one will be in the range 1 to 2. This one is also in the range 1 to 2 if it's not shifted, and it's smaller if it is right shifted. In the worst case, this one is in the range 1 to 2. So the sum of these two will be in the range 1 to 4. Okay, because if this is 1, and this one is right shifted quite a bit so that it's basically insignificant, okay, then I have 1. On the other hand, if this is almost 2, and this is almost 2, and it's not shifted, the sum here can be almost as large as 4. Therefore, I need a one position normalizing right shift. I may need a one position normalizing right shift. If the two numbers have different signs, then we may have left shift because when you add a positive number to a negative number, the result will be smaller than this. Okay, so the result will, can be, if the two numbers are pretty close to each other when you do subtraction, the result can be arbitrarily close to zero, so it can be very small. Therefore, I may need the left shift by many position, positions. Okay, so the normalizing shift will be to the left in that case, and it can involve many positions depending on how small this value gets. We can have overflow or underflow during the addition. So when you do the addition, so you basically uh, adjust the two exponents so that it's the larger of the two exponents. Okay, and then if you need, if this is the largest possible exponent already, and then you need a normalizing right shift so that you can you make the significance smaller by a factor of two, then you have to increase the exponent by one, and that can lead to overflow. So here is a block diagram of a floating point adder. So the first thing that uh, one notes here is that it's a pretty complicated piece of hardware. The addition hardware itself, the adder itself, is only a small part. So let me go through all these parts of a floating point adder to make sure we understand what they do and why they are needed. First, there's the unpack box that basically takes the two operands and unpacks them, separating the sign bits, the exponents, and the significance. And also, it inserts the hidden one, the significance as stored in, in the operands, do not have the hidden one. That hidden one must be reinserted before any arithmetic is performed. So that's the meaning of unpacking. At the other end, we have packing, which is after we compute the significant, the exponent, and the sign of the result, we pack these together into a floating point number. And in particular, we remove the hidden, we remove the first one in the significant and turn it into hidden one and represent the fractional bits in the output. There is a bypass path from the unpack box to the pack box that takes care of specialized operands. So for example, if one of the operands is zeros, this unpack box detects it. And then it just doesn't perform addition because zero, remember, has a special code and it cannot be entered directly into an arithmetic operation. But once we detect that one of the operands is zero, the other operand is basically the result of our addition. 
or in case of this is subtraction, the other operand perhaps with change of sign. Okay, similarly, if we have any of the special codes for plus or minus infinity and not a number, nan, then again the outcome of the computation is well defined and that outcome is sent to the pack box to output a special code for nan or infinity and so on. So those special operands do not go through the main data path in this diagram, but they take the bypass path from the unpack box to the pack box. Now, assuming that the two numbers are regular floating point numbers, then we take the significance and we have to do an alignment right shift. Now, either operand may need to be right shifted. But in order to save on hardware and not have to put a shifter on both of these legs, paths of the data path, we swap the two operands. So let's say this, this part of the data path has a shifter. OK. And therefore, if this operand needs to be shifted, we swap them. Also, selective complement means that if one of the numbers or both of them are negative, we complement them. And inside the floating point adder unit, arithmetic is done in true and complement format, not in sign and magnitude format, which is what we have at the input. Okay, so either operand has, may have to be complemented because either one can be negative, and either operand may have to be shifted. Okay, but that adds both to the latency because if I have complementer and shifter on both of these, I have more hardware and also more latency. So one way to design a floating point adder unit is to place the complementer in one of these paths and the shifter in the other one. I already mentioned that we will swap the two operands if this operand needs to be shifted and the shifter is on this path. I can also complement, so if the two numbers are of the same sign, then that's fine. If, say, this is positive and this is negative, uh, or the other way around, if this is positive and the other one is negative, so I have to complement this one, I can go ahead and complement this one. So instead of, let's say, x minus y, okay, which means that y should be complemented, I complement y, I compute y minus x, basically I complement x, and then I remember to complement the result at the end. So instead of x minus y, I may be computing y minus x, and I have to change the sign of the result at the end to get the intended result. Okay, then we align the significance. So if the shifter is on this path, okay, this operand will be right shifted, and this operand can be either this one or this one, which has been swapped. Then we do the actual addition. So the actual addition is only a small part. Then we have to normalize. Remember that normalization can require right shift or left shift. And then when I normalize, I basically inform the control unit to adjust the exponent accordingly. Then I have rounding and the selective complement. That's basically to change the sign of the result if it's not the correct result. And finally, after rounding, I may need another normalization because rounding 
can create an unnormalized result. Okay, so the outcome of these two normalized steps are given to the control unit, which decides how to adjust the exponent. By the way, the exponent up here, remember it has to be the larger of the two exponents. Okay, and the subtraction of the exponent not only determines the shift amount, but also tells which of the two exponents is the larger one, and therefore that one will be forwarded. So the larger of the two exponents comes here. It is adjusted according to the normalizing shift and becomes the exponent of the result. Okay, so as you see, the floating point adder is pretty adder subtractor actually because this can subtract as well as add. It's a pretty complicated piece of hardware and it has a fairly long critical path. So if I trace the critical path, it goes through the swap circuit, it goes through the alignment shift, goes through addition, then normalization, then rounding and selective complement, then a possible second normalization. So it's a fairly long path. So it's a much slower process compared with integer addition. Okay, so we have a significant aligner or pre-shifter, which is here. We have result normalizer, sometimes called the post shifter. Post means it's after, comes after the addition. We have a leading zeros detector predictor that decides how many bits of shift we need to normalize when the shift is to the left. So if we have, say, five leading zeros in the result, we have to shift by five bits. So we'll discuss this later. And the rounding unit comes later. And the sign logic, basically this, this logic, the control unit, designing it is the subject of one of the end of chapter problems. Okay, so this was basically a high level abstract description. Once you decide to actually design such a circuit, you need to pay a lot more attention to details that are missing here. So what are the types of post-normalization? Uh, when we add these two values, the magnitude of the result will be in 0 to 4. The largest it can be is just below 4, when this is 2 almost 2, and this is almost 2, and there's no shift. So that's the maximum value. That's why we need at most one bit right shift. But so the, the range 0 to 4, we can divide into three sub-ranges, 0 to 1, 1 to 2, and 2 to 4. The value is in the range 1 to 2. That's already an acceptable value for the significant, the finite triple E floating point number. Nothing needs to be done to it. If it's in 2 to 4, we need a one bit right shift and addition of 1 to the exponent. Because when you right shift by 1, you're dividing the number by 2. So you increase the exponent by 1 to compensate. When the number is in the range 0 to 1, depending on how close to 0 it is, you need you may need many bits of shift to the left to bring it in this range. Okay, so for example, if it's, let's say, 1 half, you just need 1 bit left shift to bring it to that range. 
if it's one fourth then you need two bits so you may need an arbitrary number of left shifts to bring this value to normalized range okay pre and post shifters are basically shifters they're pretty easy to design uh, here is a conceptual view of a uh, uh, shifter that can shift by any amount from 0 to 31 so the shift amount is given as a number in the range 0 to 31 and this is a 32 input multiplexer if the shift amount is 0 then the slice i of the shifter receives bit i of x if the shift amount is 1 and this is a right shifter because it's pre-shifter. If the shift amount is 1, then xi plus 1 goes into slice i. Similarly, xi plus 2 for shift amount of 2, and xi plus 31 for shift amount of 31. So the input x is connected in shifted form to various inputs, and then we just select one of those. Okay. So I mentioned, I mentioned this as a conceptual view of a shifter. This has two problems. It has a fan-in problem because the 32 to 1 mux will have a 32 input OR gate at the output, okay, which is actually implemented as an OR tree. And then each input, so for example, xi plus 2 goes to this slice also to the slice i plus 1, also to slice i, and so on. So it goes to multiple slices into different, different positions. Okay, so to avoid this problem of fan-in and fan-out, we typically design shifters as multi-stage circuits. So this is an example of how a 16-bit shifter a shifter that can shift any by any amount from 0 to 15. So the shift amount is given as a 4-bit number here. This is the least significant bit, and this is the most significant bit. So if the least significant bit is 1, we shift by 1. Okay, so this is unshifted. This is shifted by one bit, shifted by one bit. So depending on whether this LSP is zero or one, we do or do not shift by one bit. Then this one represents a shift of two bits. This one is shift of four bits. And this one is shift of eight bits. So in four stages, basically, we shift by any amount from zero to 15 bits. And this, of course, can be extended to wider shifters. Also, we can reduce the number of stages by making these, instead of two options, maybe we can have the four input mux here. And two of the bits of the shift amount are given there. Okay, So these are minor design variations. But basic idea is that we do the shifting in multiple stages in order to reduce the complexity of the circuit but of course we also add to its latency okay so in order to decide on how many bits of post shifting we need the simplest uh, design shown up here is to take the output of the adder and count the number of leading zeros or ones. Leading zeros is when we get a small positive number. Leading ones is when the number, remember we are doing complement arithmetic. So when there are many leading ones, then that's a small negative number. That also needs to be left shifted. So we count the number of zeros or ones, and depending on that count, we decide what the shift amount should be. 
But this basically lengthens, lengthens the critical path because the critical path now goes through the adder. Of course, there are a lot of things that come before the adder, as we saw before. Then it goes through leading zeros one counter, then through post shifter. Okay, an alternative to doing this is to try to predict the number of leading zeros and ones directly from the inputs to the adder. So while the adder is doing this job and computing the sum of the two numbers, in parallel with that, we also count the number of leading zeros and ones, predict the number. Of and then we are ready to do the post shifting as soon as this. So the length of the critical path is reduced by removing this leading zeros one circuit from the critical path and making it parallel to the significant add. Now here there are some details of how that prediction might work. So let me just show one example. So basically when you have the two operands, you have these G generate, annihilate, and propagate signals that you compute based on those two inputs, and you need those for the adder anyway, okay? So if you have a situation, a pattern such as this, when you're addition, you have a bunch of propagates at the left end, then a generate, then an annihilate, and so on. So this annihilate basically means that, because you have at least two annihilates there, this means this bit of the sum will be zero. Okay, so carries will not propagate beyond here. So this G generates a carry, and that carry propagates over these stages. Okay, generating a zero there. So one comes from here, one plus one is zero. Another one is generated. So th these will be basically the number of leading zeros, how many p terms you have here, okay? The other patterns are similar. So basically, the job of this leading zeros and one predictor is to sort of detect these patterns and then determine how many p's in a row you have before g. Okay, or how many P's you have in a row before A, and so on. So these patterns, once you detect these patterns and count, so you don't really need the sum in order to determine the number of leading zeros and ones. We can predict it based on this technique that I just mentioned. Again, you know, I'm skipping a lot of details, but I just want to convince you that, you know, in, in principle, it is possible to predict the number of leading zeros and ones before doing the actual addition. Actually, you, you have some flexibility here. You can do this prediction in two stages. A coarse prediction that says roughly, you know, how many you have, and then a fine tuned prediction at the end that says exactly how many you have. And that coarse prediction, because the post shifter is actually um, a multi-stage circuit anyway, so if you know, for example, that your shift will be uh, less than 8 bits or between 8 bits and 16 bits, between 8 bits and 15 bits, between 16 and 24 bits, so that, that course prediction, you can do that part of shifting while you develop the more exact number of zeros and ones, and then use that. So basically, there's some parallelism between the prediction logic and the post shifter. Okay, now one of the things that we need to 
be aware of in uh, adding is that we need a final rounding. And in order to do rounding, we need extra bits of precision in our addition. So remember, when we shift one of the operands to the right, the shift amount can be quite large because the difference of the exponents is large. So for example, if the difference of the exponents is uh, 20, then we right shift by 20. So a natural question is that do we need to keep all the 20 bits that are shifted to the right past the edge of the number, past the least significant bit? And the answer is no. All we need, all the information that we need from that part that was shifted to the right is three bits. And these are known as guard bits, round bits, and sticky bit. So let me explain what, what, why we need these three bits and why actually uh, three bits are adequate for what we want to do in the rounding stage. So the guard bit is there basically so that in case we need a left shift of one bit, then we don't lose any precision. So we keep one of those bits that were shifted to the right, and that one bit basically moves there in case we have a one bit left shift. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you why that one bit left shift is, because I told you that the left shift can be by an arbitrary amount, but this bit protects against loss of precision when the left shift is by one bit, because that bit goes and sits here, and we haven't lost any precision. The round bit is used basically to decide whether to round down or round up during the rounding process. So assuming that G was moved here, then R is now sitting here, and S is sitting here. If R bit is zero, then we round down because what we have here, if R bit is zero, then even if everything to the right was one, this is still less than one half ULP, and therefore we round down. If the R bit is one, then most of the time we'll be rounding up except in the midpoint case. And the midpoint case is when the round bit is equal to one and all the bits to the right were zero. So that's, that's the exact midway point between two floating point numbers. Again, remember I'm now thinking in terms of R bit being here after the left shift, okay? So if the R bit is equal to one, and the sticky bit, which is basically the logical OR of all the bits that were shifted past R to the right. So it's logical OR because if all those bits were zeros, then the sticky bit will be zero. If even one of those bits were equal to one, the sticky bit will be equal to one. So the name sticky uh, comes from the fact that one passing through this position sticks. It makes this bit equal to one, any one. But if all the bits that pass through this point are zeros, then this sticky bit remains zero. Okay, so if the round bit is one and the sticky bit is zero, that's the exact midway point. And we have rules, for example, round to nearest even to apply in that case. If the sticky bit is one, then this is, and the round bit is one, then we round up. Okay, so why is it that I showed special concern for the case where I have a left shift of one bit, and not for the case when I have a left shift of two bits, three bits, because in those cases, I'll be potentially losing precision because I don't have enough, I haven't kept enough bits. 
Okay, here is why. When the left shift is by one bit, then G, of course, holds the, the bit that moves in here, and I don't lose any precision. When the left shift is by two bits or more, okay, that's when the, the one of the significance was, uh, sorry, I, I should have said the alignment shift. Not, when the alignment shift is by one bit, then that one bit moves here and is preserved in case we need a left shift. Okay, because we right shifted by only one bit, we didn't lose any other bit, only this one bit which is kept. If we right shift by two or more bits, then what happens, the significant that is shifted by two or more bits, cannot exceed one half. Remember, significant is in the range one to two. So when you right shift by two bits, you essentially divide it by four. And if you right shift by three bits, you're dividing it by eight. So in the worst case, the amount of that significant does not exceed one half. Meanwhile, the unshifted significance has a magnitude of 1 to 2. And therefore, if these two have opposite signs so that this value is subtracted from it, the magnitude will be in 1 half to 2. So the difference, uh, the smallest difference is when you do 1 minus 1 half, 1 minus something that is not quite one half, a little bit. Of, so that's something that's a little bit over one half. Okay. And then the largest is when you subtract two. This is something, again, not quite two, a little bit less. Minus zero. Okay, so the difference of a line significance, the magnitude is one half two, and the normalization left shift will be by at most one bit. So either the right shift was one bit by one bit, and then you can have an arbitrary left shift, but no matter how many bits you shift, you're not losing any precision because the only bit that was moved out is kept here. On the other hand, if you shift by more than one bit, you potentially lose bits there. But this argument here shows that the normalization left shift will be by at most one bit. Therefore, again, you have the information available here and you don't lose any precision. Okay, now the argument that I presented in the previous slide has led to the design of floating point adders. And this is basically for maximum speed, when, when speed is really critical. That has two paths. This is known as a dual path floating point adder. Okay, the near path corresponds to a pre-shift of zero or one bit, either no pre-shift at all or only one bit. The far path corresponds to a pre-shift of two or more bits. So depending on which of those two cases apply, the numbers are sent to the appropriate path. Okay, when the pre-shift is by two or more bits, the post shift will be at most by one bit, as argued in the previous slide. When the pre-shift is by zero or one bit, the post shift can be arbitrary. So by using these dual paths, we avoided the need for incorporating shifters with arbitrary shift capability, both for pre-shifting and post-shifting. So in one path, we have arbitrary pre-shift, 
but a very simple pulse shift. So this is much faster than an arbitrary shifter. In the other path, we have, again, very simple 0 or 1-bit shifter and an arbitrary shifter here. So the critical path basically consists of this very simple shifter and an arbitrary shifter in both cases. So I saved a little bit on the latency, but the downside is that I'm using a lot more hardware. I'm using two adders. Two, of course, I, I needed two arbitrary pre-shifters anyway, even if I did not have an arbitrary pre-shifter and arbitrary post-shifter on the same path. So the extra hardware is one, a copy of the adder here, and the two one-bit shifters that did not exist in the original design. So this is basically used when we absolutely have to have the highest possible speed. Okay, this slide I'm going to skip. It's just an explanation of rounding using those three bits, guard, round, and sticky. A little bit more details. Okay, when you do floating point addition, uh, you can have exceptions. Overflow and underflow are obvious exceptions that can occur. And overflow and underflow can occur uh, basically also after this exponent adjustment. Because if the adjustment increases expon the exponent by 1, and it is only already the maximum possible value, Okay, or if you add to the exponent because this normalization required many shifts and therefore a large value will be added, so you can have overflow there. Okay, I'm going to let me skip the other details in this slide and proceed with multipliers, floating point multipliers, and dividers. Now, conceptually, a floating point multiplier is simpler than the other. As you see from the block diagram, there are fewer, fewer pieces involved. We again have the unpack and pack boxes, which serve the exact same function. And there's a bypass path between the two. In case we have special operands, we directly generate the result. So we multiply the significance, add the exponents, x or the signs. And then we may have to normalize, in which case we need to adjust the exponent. And after rounding, we need to normalize again and perhaps adjust the exponent. Because the product of two significance, each of which is in the range 1 to 2, will be in 1 to 4. OK, we need a 1 bit post shift to the right and addition of 1 to uh, the exponent. OK, so uh, when, the, when we multiply the significance, we get the double width product here. And that double width product eventually will be rounded to a single width product after normalizing. So in order to reduce the latency, in order to avoid cascading all these things together and increasing the critical path, many multipliers produce the lower half of the product for rounding information, where the rounding information is applied. OK, early. So when you multiply the significant, the lower half of the product may come out earlier than the upper half. And that lower half is basically what we use to decide how to round the upper half. And those decisions can be made while the upper half is still being produced.
And therefore, for example, if we decide that the product needs to be rounded up based on the lower half of the product that we see here, we can incorporate that rounding into the multiplication process so that we don't have an additional latency over here. Floating point dividers, the block diagram is almost identical to floating point multiplier, except that we have a divide unit here and subt we subtract the exponents. Again, uh, when you divide two significance in the range 1 to 2, you can get a value in the range 0.5 to 2, and you may need a left shift to normalize this and put it in the range 1 to 2. Okay, so if the uh, division result is in the range 0.5 to 1, you need to multiply it by 2. And subtract one from the exponent and again you may get overflow if the exponent is already the minimum possible when you subtract one uh, it can lead to overflow okay and rounding considerations in divide uh, the quotient must be produced with two extra bits g and r in case we have to do a normalizing left shift as discussed here. Okay, and the remainder acts as the sticky bit that we had for addition. So if the remainder is zero, we are at the midpoint after generating the two extra bits. And if the remainder is non-zero, then it's like the sticky bit being one. Okay, increasingly we are implementing fused multiply add units, sometimes known as FMA, fused multiply add. Because the operation multiply adds, computing AX plus B is a very useful operation. And it's encountered in many computations. For example, when you do polynomial evaluation, you basically do repeated multiply adds. You initialize S to zero. Then in each step, you multiply S by the value of Z the polynomial is in Z, and add the next coefficient and so on. This is the Horner's, well-known Horner's group. So basically, we have repeated multiply add steps. And it would be nice if we had an operation for this that took less time than doing a separate multiplication to compute this part, and then adding this term to it. And I'll show you how that can be done. Also, in dot product computation, we have a bunch of multiplies. And then the products must be added together. So you initialize a running total S to 0. And as you generate each of these products, you add it to that. Okay, So you have multiply immediately followed by add. Okay, so this is uh, one way of designing an FMA, Fused Multiply Add Unit. Remember, A, X, and B are all floating point numbers, okay? So the normal way of computing this is multiply A by X, round the result. Okay, so now this becomes a single floating point number a times x. Then add to b, and when you add to b, it may be the case that b has the smaller exponent, or this product ax has the smaller exponent. So either one of those may have to be right shifted for alignment in floating point addition. 
Okay? If we want to merge these operations together, then we don't develop AX separately, and therefore we have no idea whether AX has the smaller exponent or B has the smaller exponent. So here's what we do. So here is the multiplier part, significant of A, significant of X. Multiples are performed using bits of X. Multiples of A, S, A are formed. And they enter into a carry save adder. So this is the product in carry save form. So I have developed this product A times X in carry save form. At this point, I don't know what the uh, normalization will be like because the carry save number does not give me the number of leading zeros directly. And furthermore, even if I knew that, shifting this carry save number is less convenient. So what I do, I basically compute, so EA plus EX is the exponent of this product. Minus EB is the difference between the exponent of the product and the exponent of B. And this number can be positive or negative. So I compute from the three exponent EA plus EX, which collectively are the exponent of the product before any normalization, and minus EB, which is the exponent of so if this number is positive, means this one has the bigger exponent, and therefore B must be right shifted. If this number is negative, it means that B has the larger exponent. Therefore, normally the product would have to be right shifted. But instead of right shifting the product, we left shift B for alignment. Okay, so this is a major difference here. So B, the alignment pre-shift for B can be to the right or to the left, depending on whether this number is positive or negative. OK, so now our significance, this one in carry save form and this one standard form, are available in aligned format. We do carry save addition because there are three things to be added. And then a regular addition. And then we may need normalization at the end. Again, in order to speed things up, instead of waiting until this addition result is known and then counting the leading zeros and ones, we directly look at these three things that are being added and design a special circuit to predict the number of leading zeros and ones, and therefore the amount of normalization shift. Okay, now this circuit is a little bit more complex than the leading zeros and ones predictions for a normal floating point adder, because the prediction is now based on three operands rather than two. Okay. So more hardware goes in here, but it's still practical to design the circuit so that its latency does not exceed the latency of this other path. So there are three optimizations that make this fused multiply add more efficient, faster than using separate multiply and add. First of all, we keep the product in carry safe form. So we avoid an addition here in order to develop the product in ordinary binary format. Optimization two is that we do pre-shift of B to the right or to the left instead of waiting for this to become available and then shifting that if needed. We always shift B, so this part is completely overlapped with the other part. And optimization three is this technique of leading zeros and ones prediction that is done in parallel with this carry save addition and regular addition. Therefore, the critical path for the circuit is basically 
as I mentioned, you know, this alignment pre-shift is overlapped with this, so this is the critical path. This uh, tree multiplier part, carry save adder, regular adder, and normalization hardware. Okay, so this is much faster than separate multiplies and adds, and therefore it leads to significant speed up. Of course, we are using a lot more hardware. This shifter can shift to the left and, or to the right. Therefore, the number that we get out of this can be quite wide because it should have bits to the left and bits to the right. So this is a wider operand. Of course, once we build this, we can use it as a simple adder or simple multiplier. Of course, that won't be the most efficient use of this hardware. If I set x to 1, then this acts as an ordinary adder. If I set b to 0, then this serves as a regular multiplier. Okay, so if I implement this in my floating point unit, I don't need to have separate adders and separ a separate multiplier. But of course, I pay a speed penalty because this will be slower than a regular adder, and it will be slower than a regular multiplier. OK, the final part of today's discussion is uh, Designing an arithmetic unit for logarithmic numbers, for numbers represented in logarithmic number system. And as I mentioned uh, last time, uh, the main attraction of logarithmic arithmetic is that multiplication and division are converted to addition and subtraction. So when you want to multiply two numbers, find the log of their product, you just add the inputs, which are the logs of the operands, division becomes subtraction. But add subtract becomes more difficult. So going in, because we don't know how much more difficult, you know, there may be this worry that uh, if we lose too much speed in addition, maybe this advantage of faster multiplication and division is nullified and therefore we don't gain anything. It turns out that as long as the word width in the logarithmic number system is not too wide, addition actually does not become much slower. And therefore, there will be an overall speed gain, given that multiplication and division are much faster. So basically, we want to, do, we want to add two logarithmic numbers each having a sign and logarithm to find the sum, the sign of the sum and the logarithm of the sum. Okay, so basically we want to compute the log of x plus or minus y, okay, addition or subtraction, given log of x and log of y. Okay, so our inputs are log of x and log of y. But we want log of x plus y, there's no simple computations like multiply and divide to do this, okay? So let's do some uh, transformations here. So I write log of x plus or minus y as log of x times 1 plus or minus y over x. And then log of the product of two terms is the sum of the logs. So log of x plus log of 1 plus or minus y over x. Okay, so what I know, what I'm given is log of x and log of y. So how would I go about computing this term? Okay, I don't know y over x. And even if I knew, I still need to compute log of this value. Okay, even though I don't know y over x, I know the logarithm of this term. Or I can easily derive the logarithm because log of this term is log of y minus log of x, and those are given to me. 
So I do this subtraction, log of y minus log of x. So I find the log of this term. Okay, let's say that log is delta. Okay, that log is delta. Then I need the term itself, which is inverse logarithm of delta, and then I need to compute this log. Okay, so this is a single variable function. Log of 1 plus or minus log inverse log of delta. Once I compute delta, delta is a word given to me. I need to compute the single variable function of delta. And I can do this by table lookup. Okay. The reason this transformation is necessary is that I could have said, okay, let's let's just do table lookup right here. But I have two operands. If each of these, let's say, is 16 bits wide, the two operands collectively will be 32 bits, and I need a huge table of size 2 to the 32. But this delta is a single variable. Okay, and therefore my table can be manageable as long as this delta or the original log of x and log of y are not too wide. So I call this function phi plus for the case where this sign is plus and phi minus for the case where this sign is minus. And therefore, log of x plus y and log of x minus y, in other words, addition and subtraction, can be performed by a table lookup to read out this value, and then addition to add log of x. Okay, similarly for subtraction. This is a different table. I read from that table, given the value of delta, I read from the table the function phi minus of delta and add it to log of x. So as long as these tables are not too huge, huge tables will be expensive and also slower. Okay, so as long as they're not too huge, this will be a fairly efficient way of doing addition. So this is a four function logarithmic arithmetic unit. A four function meaning it does Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay, let's trace the path of signals for addition, let's say. So log of x and log of y come here. I compute the delta by using this circuit as a subtractor. And that delta is input into my ROM table. And depending on whether I'm doing the operation is addition or subtraction, I read the phi plus or phi minus table, the data comes out. So delta is given as the address, data comes out, and that data is added to log of x, which is supplied through this path. Okay, remember in the previous slide, I need to compute log of x plus the readout from one of these tables. So that's the readout from the table, and this is log of x, and this will be the log of sum. So that's for addition and subtraction. This adder subtractor is used to compute delta, table lookup occurs, and then the result the readout from the table is added to or subtract, uh, let's see, it's added to, I guess in all cases, is added to that we read out from the table. Okay, what about multiplication and division? In multiplication and division, the logarithms are added or subtracted. So this will be basically the result of multiplication and division. Except that in logarithmic representation I mentioned last time, we usually use a scale factor so that all the logarithms are positive. And normally, log, logarithms of numbers that are greater than 1 are positive. 
and less than 1 are negative. In order to get rid of that pesky sign for the logarithm and deal with unsigned numbers, one way is to scale all, num all numbers by multiplying them by m. Okay, so going back here, if you scale your numbers by multiplying by m, then the scaling is no problem in addition because instead of x, basically, you have m times x, logarithm of m times x, logarithm of m times y, and logarithm of m times 1, y, x plus y. So, however, here, if each of these is scaled, so this is log of mx, in other words, it's log of x plus log of m, and this is log of y plus log of m. So the scale factor is uh, included twice. I have to subtract log of m. And in this case, the scale factor cancels out. So log of x plus log of m minus log of y minus log of m. So I have to add log of m in order to reintroduce the scale factor. So that second adder in this is uh, in this uh, four function ALU is used to take care of that scale factor. So the sum of the logarithms or the difference of the logarithms come here. If I'm doing multiplication, I have to add. Uh, sorry, I have to subtract the scale factor. If I'm doing division. I have to add the scale factor, so I use this adder subtractor accordingly to take care of that scale factor. So remember, the scale factor is not a problem in addition or subtraction because numbers and their sum are scaled in the same way. When you multiply two scaled numbers, you have uh, basically double scaling and you have to re remove one of those factors, remove log of m. And when you divide, you have to add log of m. Now, these tables, including the two functions that you need for addition and subtraction, these are the two functions, phi plus and phi minus. Okay, phi plus is a fairly well-behaved function. So if you just store the values of phi plus at some fixed intervals, and then use the interpolation to find values between those two, given that the function is fairly smooth and doesn't have you know, abrupt changes, interpolation, linear interpolation between these two stored values always gives you pretty accurate results. Okay? And this subtraction function, the second function, phi minus, on the other hand, is problematic because it has this huge curvature here and you know, large variations for small changes in the value of d. Yeah, this d is actually the same as delta. Okay. So one way to deal with this problem is to, if you want to use interpolation, to use intervals that are wider in this area where the function is pretty smooth, and then use intervals that are smaller, narrower over here to get more precision. And here is an example of how you can do that. For example, any value less than eight in this interval, the function is almost straight line. 
So you need very few subintervals in order to accurately uh, evaluate the function through interpolation. And that area, that region, is characterized by the numbers starting with 1, 0. So it's easy to detect which of these regions you are operating in. Oops, sorry. Then if the starting bits are 1, 1, 0, you are in this region from negative 8 to negative 4. Still, the function is pretty good. So you can have probably a little bit smaller intervals. And as you go towards this problematic region, you can have smaller and smaller intervals. But because you're doing those smaller intervals for very narrow range, okay, you don't introduce a lot of table entries. If you try to have you know, small intervals throughout, you would need a huge table. But because you don't have small intervals for much of the range, and only the intervals become very small toward the right end here, then the table size will be manageable. OK, so just uh, so that you can see an actual implementation of uh, logarithmic arithmetic. Uh, a couple of decades ago, a team of European researchers built this European logarithmic microprocessor as a feasibility study uh, to show that you can actually design a microprocessor, general purpose microprocessor, that uses logarithmic arithmetic with operands that are 32 bits wide. Okay, so 32, remember, is quite large for using a direct table lookup such as the one shown here. Okay, so you almost have to use interpolation with smaller tables. So this is actually the uh, addition subtraction scheme that they used in this particular microprocessor. So there are two tables here that is basically straight linear interpolation. Okay, so you have uh, one of those intervals and then the basically displacement within that interval. And the displacement, so this is sort of the linear interpolation, it's F plus D times delta. Okay, so re you read out the two coefficients F and D from these two tables and then multiply one of those coefficients by delta and add those together. But before adding those two together, they develop this error com compensation scheme. There are two other tables here. In order to minimize the error committed as a result of that interpolation, they have a scheme that requires the use of two other tables. Okay, so this, this is basically F plus D delta, two things. And this is basically the product of these two. This is the error compensation term. And then this is another compensation term. And then these four values need to be added. You use a 4 to 2 counter, 4 to 2 CSA, and then a regular adder at the end. So by using this uh, scheme of interpolating and also using an error compensation scheme, you are able to implement addition and subtraction with reasonable complexity and speed for 32-bit logarithmic numbers. Most logarithmic uh, Arithmetic is used in signal processing with low precision. Uh, let's say 8 and 12 are quite common, uh, 16, uh, 20. Okay, so up to about 20 points, uh, 20 bits, you have no problem implementing the table lookup schemes. For 32 bits, you know, the researchers for this particular project had to develop 
new schemes to make it feasible to do addition using table look. Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to say about floating point operations and the associated logarithmic uh, arithmetic unit. So next time we will deal with chapter 19 and a little bit from chapter 20. Uh, chapter 19 deals with error and error control and chapter 20 deals with high precision arithmetic. Okay, until the next lecture, goodbye and uh, stay healthy. Bye.